This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I'm joined by someone I'm sure most of you know, Michael Malice. He's an author. He co-writes a lot of books with celebrities. He's on uh, Fox shows like Kennedy all the time. And, and at least for our purposes, he's perhaps most famous for his book, Dear Reader, which is an in-the-voice uh, autobiography from the perspective of Kim Jong-il in North Korea. So what we're talking about today is uh, sort of in scare quotes, the economics of North Korea, because obviously Michael has been there and has a perspective that, Michael, I'm going to say, there, I can't imagine there's more than maybe 100 Americans or so who have even uh, uh, decided to go there since the Korean War. But maybe I'm wrong. You talk about it not being that easy, that hard to, to visit. Uh, I'm sure it's more than 100, to be fair. I mean, because it's been, what, 60 years. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not a huge number at all. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a pain in the ass. Well, so what's interesting is it's, it's difficult to find uh, aggregate economic data about North of Korea. Course. GDP is this sort of, uh, uh, you know, put your finger in the air type uh, prediction. Some people say it's about $30 billion, which is maybe a little over $1,000 per capita. So so what's interesting to me is, is by that measure alone, if that's ballpark true, it's not necessarily among the five or 10 poorest places on earth. Would you agree or, or disagree f- with that? I, I mean... The poverty is not the problem. Do you know what I mean? If yeah. they were just poor, I wouldn't care about them one way or another. Uh, so you know, so, so to speak, it, it's that doesn't isn't what makes North Korea uniquely terrible. Well, so when you when you arrived, did they require you to exchange U.S. dollars for their local currency? No, no, no. So here's why North Korean tourism became a thing. Uh, and this just speaks to uh, something that all the listeners will be very interested in. Before the Cold War ended, uh, Kim Il-sung, the great leader, played uh, the Soviet Union and China against each other. And basically, North Korea was a literal welfare state. So what they did is they would have something called friendship prices. So Soviet Union would send North Korea oil and North Korea in barter would sell them like crappy socks that Russians could have no use for. And they would call it a wash. So by this way, they subsidized the North Korean economy. However, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, no one, neither China nor uh, now Russia, wanted to subsidize this uh, insane regime. So they, without oil, it, 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 I talk about this in my book, it was an inversion of that great uh, Leonard Reed essay, I Pencil, because without oil, you can't run the factories. Without factories, you can't produce fertilizer. Without fertilizer, you can't grow enough food in this mountainous country. And that led to a famine of one to two million people, So, uh, which was a genocide. So what they desperately want for the tourists is hard currency, because obviously we're not big fans of fiat dollars, but the US fiat is a lot less of a rights violation than the North Korean currency. So they want you to spend your US dollars or RMB or euros because then that will is something that will be a, a hold of value. I think it's illegal for foreigners to use, they have different currencies for different people. So I believe it's illegal for foreigners to use North Korean currency. So it's interesting. They have the the Central People's Committee. They actually do have industries. They're strictly planned. They, it looks like they have some mining, some degree of agriculture, farming, yes. uh, fishing. Did, did you? I know you traveled in the countryside up to the DMZ. Did you see much in the way of uh, of of anything industrious? Oh, happening? Well, you know, you know all these commie countries. There, it's not like like the hippies of the left. They are real big on industry and factories and all this stuff. The North Korean seal has like a, a dam and, a, you know, these like power court, power wires. So they took you, you know, you come to New York or even if I went to Auburn, you're not taking me to, to like the coal mine or you're not taking me to like the Con Ed plant in North Korea. Oh, yeah. We went to the the, the b- water bottling factory. We went to the uh, hospital. They're very pr- one of the things that they make people go to is this barrage, which is a kind of dam that they built. And you have to climb like 10 stories of stairs and they could tell you about this great barrage. It's like the fourth biggest in the world or something. And all the tourists who go there are like, you're just showing me a dam. You know, I could have looked at a picture of this back home. So they're very big on their industry and very proud of it because that's their claim that before 
uh, uh, the great leader Kim Il Sung drove out the the wicked Jap devils, as they call them. You know, he brought industry to North Korea and turned it from an agrarian country into a 21st century. That's a very Stalinist idea that you know, once the communists take over, they what what is it? Lenin's quote is that communism is socialism plus electricity. Why do you think that the the Chinese don't do more? Why why don't they sort of take them in, in as a client state? Do you think you think North Korea is an embarrassment for China? North Korea is clearly an embarrassment for China, and I'll give you a couple of examples. During the seventies, uh, they built a I think it's ten story statue of the great leader Kim Il Sung in Pyongyang. You can see a photo of me next to that statue uh, on my website, and they plated it in gold. And the Chinese uh, leadership at the time said, you know, <laughs> we're communists. Maybe a giant gold plated statue isn't what we're about. So they're like, good point, And they changed it to bronze. So that was one of the problems that they had between China and, and North Korea. But North Korea, in their propaganda and in their worldview, they revel in the fact that they're a country that's the size of Pennsylvania. Obviously, they wouldn't use that reference. And they are defying China the United States, Russia, Japan, they call themselves a shrimp among whales. So the fact that China will say, do this and that, uh, the Marshal Kim Jong-un can turn to the population and say, look, we're getting pressure from all these other countries that are bigger than us, but I'm so tough, I'm so great, I'm defying them, and he has a point. When you look at, at the, the people you met, who, who obviously your guides and, and some other people you met were, were relatively fortunate by North Korean oh, yes. standards, and, and clearly they're steering you around as to where you can go. But did you gain any sense uh, of sort of the personal economics of individuals there? Are they, uh, you know, their habitations, their heat, air conditioning, diet? I mean, all these things we hear about, but we don't, you know, it seems very amorphous to us how, how impoverished their sort of day-to-day -day personal economics are. I mean, they, t they took us to a farm and we, there was like a model family, you know what I mean? A grandma and her grandkids. The grandkids are filthy. I mean, quite literally filthy. I mean, the home is fake because they've got a TV and all this other stuff. But everywhere you go in North Korea, everywhere, there is a crack on the wall, a stain on the carpet, uh, some, uh, rust in the, in the bathroom. Uh, even on everywhere you go, there's a fly. Even on the on the plane, there was a fly, which is like a, such a biblical symbol of evil and corruption. You go to their central park; they have this big fountain. The water is yeah. not running. The lights aren't on. It's covered in mildew. I mean, it, it, the decay and the scent. Like I have, I brought back books from North Korea. You can smell that decay in these books. It's 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 impossible to describe. It's almost like a cellar, but worse. So. When you're in Pyongyang at night, capital city, right, any capital city, the fact that half the buildings don't have electricity, I mean, and this is as good as it gets. So, yeah, everywhere you go, this idea that some people have in the West that you go to Pyongyang and it's like going to Epcot, it is not at all like that. It is completely uh, just decaying. And I, I think one of the reasons is if you're pointing out that things are broken or wrong, that, in effect, is criticizing the government subtly. So people know how to keep their heads down and their mouth shut. You don't want to be a troublemaker. Although I was called a troublemaker by my guide, but that's okay. Well, how do they even have, if we think about the economics as sort of a concentration camp, how do they even have black markets? I mean, you talk about seeing people at the airport bringing in Western electronics, but what do they have to, to even trade on a black market? Um, so a lot of times people will go to China and bring back food. So what, ha what one of the the, one of the good things about the weakness of the regime is that the the thugs, the police, the enforcers are much more susceptible to bribery uh, mm. because basically it works like a tax. You'll have a black market it, in a public square. It's open, you know, open air. The cops will come down. He gets his cut, uh, looks the other way, and you have this, you know, exchange. And the government every so often tries to crack down. But since they can't provide food, their hands are essentially being tied. So this is a great example of kind of this, you know, a lot of libertarians talk about agorism, you know, having the black market supersede the state. That is happening in North Korea. And what's very, very healthy about it is you can tell me all day long and convince me that the great leader Kim Il-sung is the most wonderful person who ever lived. That's fine. You're not going to be able to convince me that it's great that my kids are starving. I mean, that's a very hard sell to make. So at the end of the day, you could have this cognitive dissonance that, yeah, great leader Kim Il-sung is the best person ever. It's the Americans' fault that we don't have food. Fine. But I'm still not going to obey the law. 
and because I'm going to make sure I have food in my stomach. And what's really sick about, you know, there's so many layers of evil with North Korea. During the 90s, when the famine hit and they refused to allow food in, the people who were the most loyal were the first ones to starve because they thought <laughs> food's coming, food's coming. I trust the leader. He's always provided us in the past. And the ones who were like, this is nonsense. I got to look out for number one. Those are the ones who managed to get food. So, I mean, this talks about how the totalitarian state perverts any sense of decency and sanity in, in peaceful relations between human beings. What's interesting to me is, is the mysteriousness surrounding Kim Jong-il. Usually, excuse me, Kim Jong-un, usually there are, you know, in, in a lot of poor countries, the leaders live in, in these gilded palaces and are very ostentatious with their oh, wealth yes. and their Rolls Royces and such. Whereas here, you said, you know, you don't even know, really know which government building is which, and there's no great palace for the supreme leader. Right. Right. Um, I mean, they weren't even told that he existed until I think it was 2009. So the leadership is not something that's discussed in the sense that we can talk about, you know, the Kennedy family or the Clinton dynasty or the Bushes. They are treated hmm. as this kind of um, supernatural almost entities. So the fact that recently uh, Kim Jong-un is trotting his wife around, this is a uh, very recent development. Uh, during his lifetime, it was not clear at all how many wives Kim Jong-il had. Uh, he even became a bigamist because, his, as I talk about in my book, his first wife was kept secret from his father, the great leader uh, Kim Il-sung, because she was born uh, uh, she had, uh, uh, she was previously married, and so on and so forth. So he he got married again uh, secretly. So. It, this family is not uh, uh, there's no books at the airport where you can learn what you, I mean. Yeah, there, there are books about what Kim Jong Il was like as a kid, but this does not bear re truth to reality. Well, at least judging by, you know, your Korean guides, your hosts, that it doesn't seem like they, like Koreans go around thinking that they're part of this uh, communist ideology or, or even worshiping the Kim family, that they're, they're, they're more just seeing themselves as Koreans and this is what they have to do. Is there, did, did you sense any sort of, sort of open ideological thought or is this just getting through the day? I, I think when you're dealing with elites in cities, just like here, you're going to have, you know how like in New York, and I'm, I'm speaking someone from Brooklyn, the, and this is not something I admire, but there is this snide uh, contempt for like the heartland, right? It's just like, oh, we're better than them. So when the people who I talked to in Pyongyang, my guide, she very much saw herself as this urban cosmopolitan figure. Um, she knew about slang from South Korea. Uh, she was trying to present herself. And, and in a mm -hmm. sense, she was because to even step foot in Pyongyang by law, you have to be very high up in North Korean society. So if you're mm -hmm. living there and I mean, let alone interacting with foreigners, you are off the charts in terms of your status in that country. That's being a celebrity effectively. So she very much was aware of her status. And, and here's one telling story um, in North, and I, I, I was, I was tr very much trying to empathize with her and see things from her perspective, uh, have, especially having been born in the Soviet Union. At one point she talked about how during once a year, everyone by law has to go to the countryside and help with the rice harvest. <laughs> and naively I said, oh, that, that sounds really nice. And, and Jeff, you can imagine that actually it could be something that's fun, like we're all doing this together, maybe like a Fourth of July thing. And she looks at me, she's like, yeah, it's great. And, you know, I felt stupid because you realize this woman who's like a millionaire in her high heels and like as frou-frou as it gets, for her, it's like green acres. It's like, I got to go with the hit. And I asked her, I said, uh, you know, it, back home, we look down on people at the countryside. Is it the same thing here? She's like, she literally said, of course. And it's, which is so interesting because so much of their propaganda is the farmer, the guy in touch with the soil. These are the true people. And she's like, are you I mean, the disdain from her was uh, immense. So it's not this, you know, their propaganda is to create what they call a monolithic ideological system. The idea that everyone in North Korea thinks mm -hmm. with one mind. It is not mm -hmm. that way at all. They're, it, they are so normal and, and trying to be normal in the most abnormal country on Earth. I was shocked and delighted by how easy it was to have a conversation with her. Well, you know, they're so close, even compared to, you know, we, th we talk about the former Soviet Union, but uh, the Soviet Union had the entire West to look at in terms of prices, technology, right. media, 
uh, clothes, music, y- you name it. I mean, here we talk about the the impossibility of calculation in so in a socialist system. Here, other than it sounds, other than a little, it sounds like there's a little trickle maybe of goods from China, but otherwise, how how do they? How do they ha- have an economy? Do they actually do they actually talk about the the Central People's Committee? Do they actually brag about their five and seven year plans? N- not anymore. They use they oh, see. Here's another good example. So you know every you know these these what's funny with these uh, commie states is that every so often they'll have a new movement, right? Stankovite, I think, was one of the, was the Russian one. Like, oh, now. We're going to start all working harder and faster at the same time, even though that was what our plan three years ago and our plan 10 years ago. So they had something called the Cholima movement, which, it, you know, it's funny because they'll steal an idea from Russia and pretend it's original to them. So it's like, oh, it's, it's completely different because ours is, has the symbol of a Pegasus. So the Cholima, Cholima is their, uh, it's a Pegasus, it's their symbol of speed. And I asked my guide, I go, what do you want me to send you from abroad if I could send you something? And she said, a Porsche. And I said, lady, I'm not sending you a Porsche. She said it immediately, she's quick. I said, lady, I'm not sending you a Porsche and don't ask me to send you Cholima either. And she goes, we have the original one here. What do I need you to send it to me for? So she was very, very quick. So again, every so often they'll have these movements, but that has fallen by the wayside. That that used to be very much the case in the great leader Kimmel song. There would be the first five-year plan, then the three-year plan. I talk about this at length in my book. And the big argument was, are we going to have heavy industry or light industry? It's these very kind of old school communist arguments. And now I think that is not a thing whatsoever. I think the Congress meets very rarely. Uh, and it's much more of a year-by-year situation. You know, I saw some of your, uh, your back and forth uh, on, on Twitter with various people since obviously uh, North Korea's been in the news with the Olympics and everything. Um, do you do you think that there are uh, concentration camps, secret concentration camps that maybe even your your hosts didn't know about? I mean, do people do people whisper about, refer to things? Are there gulags? Um, you know, pl- places where criminals are, are set in big numbers. Um. There's clearly concentration camps. You could see them on Google Earth. There's a great organization called Human Rights in North Korea. Every year they'll have a different an update on the, the concentration camp system. Um, there, and there's different levels of camps. Some you get to leave. Some you are death sentences. I, I've heard very many conflicting reports mm-hmm. from North Koreans I've spoken to and research about how much do the North Koreans know about these camps. What is very known is every so often people would disappear with their families. And I spoke to one of my, uh, a refugee I knew, and I said, what did you think of this? And she's like, it was a good thing because clearly they did something wrong and, you know, they broke the law. Um, And we can relate to that because there's a lot of times if you see someone on TV going to jail, uh, you think, okay, it's a good thing they're going to jail. You don't put two and two together that what they may have done is listen to a CD (laughs) of, of, you know, South Korean music or something like that. It's, it's something that, you have that, you know, you're taught a certain thing since you're a kid. Um, but yeah, they very much are aware at any, but that's the other misconception. It's not the kind of thing where, you know, Jeff, if I steal a pencil, I'm going to camp. It, it's not uh, binary that like, as soon as you do something wrong, you go in the camp, there's levels of punishment. So uh, people live in fear. Yeah. Of going to camp, but also a very common punishment is, oh, you're a college professor. You, you know, betrayed the party. Now you're going to work, be a farmhand for the rest of your life. Wow. So yeah, that's a far cry from the camp, but it's still quite a step down that now you have to work the, the earth and you will never have a second set of clothes. Do you think there's any chance? I mean, what would it take to get mobile devices into North Korea? What would it take to get they Wi-Fi beamed in from, from Cuba? I know they have cell phones. I mean, what, what's, yeah. what, what, what would it take to, to, to open it up in terms of communication, internet? So that, that's ha- what, what they have now is you'll have people in the Northeast is where the people who are most disloyal to the regime are forced to live. And there's a, the border between that and China is very porous. So you will have like people who are in South Korea will call these brokers using like Chinese cell phones and communicate with their family back home. And this is a very big mechanism for uh, information to be getting into North Korea. So one of the great things about information is if I want to smuggle guns, if I want to smuggle drugs, you know, guns will set off a metal detector. A dog will smell drugs. Information you can't bottle that up. It costs nothing to move. It costs nothing to transmit. 
I tell it to you. I still have it in my mind. So it's very, very, very hard to uh, control information, especially in a gossipy culture uh, like North Korea. And that's been a very healthy thing where, uh, you know, there's an expression. I, I forget the exact expression, but it's something how like, you know, how the walls have ears. So people are very paranoid and there's certain things you just do not discuss unless it's with your family. But there's levels. You know, so and there's also, you know, and I, I knew this growing up coming from a Soviet household, how you can, you know, do double talk and tell, tell the information, but you have plausible deniability. Like, for example, you know, back in the day, if my mom called her mom in Russia and it'd be like, oh, does your neighbor want to come visit America in March? Oh, no, that's bad weather in America. You know what I mean? Even mm -hmm. though someone's listening on the phone and mm -hmm. everyone knows what's going on, but you could still play dumb. So there's all these little tricks that they have uh, to work around the censors. And, and that's why in many ways the North Korean propaganda has changed and their hold is really weakening on the people year by year. Well, last question for you is about demographics. I read an interesting article from, article from this hedge fund manager who says, well, there's a billion gallons, billion barrels of oil in Korea, and they have reasonably young demographics. Is, are people having kids? I mean, is it a, is it a youngish country in that sense? Is there any hope uh, that, I, that demographics are going to change things? I, I, I mean, as sick as it sounds, I would bet money that the old people died off because it's going to be very – you're not having medical care it's yeah. going to be very easy to, I mean, life expectancy is not going to be very high. So yeah, people are having kids. Absolutely. Um, and that is, and again, it's the younger people are becoming much more cynical because they don't remember the so-called good times under the great leader, Kim Il-sung. He died in 94 when there was kind of food on the table, when you did have, you know, China and, and the Soviet Union uh, kind of protecting the North Korean regime. When Kim, and I talk about this in my book also, when Kim Jong-il, shortly before he takes over, they had a propaganda campaign called Let's Eat Two Meals a Day, because they said <laughs> having three meals a day is unhealthy. So yeah. I, I, no one needs to be told this, do you know what I mean? So it, it's, it's, it's a very, they don't remember what it was like when uh, North Korea was strong and proud. Well. Michael Malice, we're about out of time. Thanks so much for that. Uh, I can't recommend the book enough. My dear reader, uh, an unauthorized biography. My son, my 11-year-old son loved it. Uh, be sure to follow Michael Malice on Twitter and subscribe to his YouTube channel because he's going to start doing live feeds at YouTube. So, Michael, thanks a lot again for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.